Get access to hundreds more exclusive history documentaries by downloading the History Hit app. Within a mile and a half of Manchester Town Hall, there were 30 acres of buildings destroyed completely. Uh, it was just devastation. The, the bombs as they were going, it, it was just absolutely continuous. We couldn't hear the planes, but we could hear the noises, uh, the, um, the bombs, as they were crashing down. It was. Well, it's still with me today. My mother had gone looking for me after the, you know, was all clear had gone. And all she saw was people being carried out on stretchers. And she thought I was one of them. The first night, which was the 22nd of December uh, of 1940, uh, we were in the um, in a shelter, which was actually was in the works opposite where we lived, and we all used to go into that shelter when there was a you know an air raid. We used to go in there. When we came came out of there the next morning, our home had gone. The whole about three, four streets had been destroyed completely, wiped out. Within two minutes of the sirens going, the first wave of bombers came over and they started dropping the incendiaries. There were thousands of incendiary bombs dropped. I'd never heard my mum swear, ever. But she swore that night. And it was all bloody Hitler this and bloody Hitler that. <laughs> it was funny. The Battle of Britain and the blitz of English towns and cities which followed began with the fall of France. In June 1940, the German army swept through northern France and Hitler stood in Paris as his troops marched in and occupied the nation's capital. With the fall of Paris, the French government capitulated and met the Germans to hammer out peace terms for the second time in just over 21 years in a railway carriage in the French forest of Compiègne. On the first occasion, it had been the Germans who had come in defeat to sign the terms of surrender. This time, the tables were turned and they came as conquerors. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries from History Hit and uncover the secrets of some of the most famous people and events in history. History Hit brings you the stories that shaped the world through exclusive documentaries from the world's top historians. Travel with us to the bloody Battle of Stalingrad or uncover the lives of the people who called Pompeii home. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. But there was still a little matter of France's allies to be taken care of. The British army had been pushed back to the limits of French soil, the beaches of Dunkirk.
The German army swept through northern France, past the abandoned vehicles of the retreating British, and reached the final battleground on the coast. As the men congregated on the beach, the fate of the British army hung in the balance. But back in England, makeshift fleets of ferries and little boats of all sorts had been quickly assembled. They made their way across the channel to take off the beaches as many of the Allied soldiers as they could cram into their small vessels. The evacuation of the British, with the French troops who had refused to surrender, began under heavy German gunfire. Fortunately for Britain at this point, Hitler was to make a vital error in this closing campaign. He halted the advance of the so far unstoppable German ground troops in order to grant the Luftwaffe chief, Hermann Göring, the glory of letting his air force finish off the Allied forces on land and at sea. Göring failed in his aim to obliterate the survivors at Dunkirk in spite of damage inflicted by his Luftwaffe. But Hitler had achieved his goal. His troops had reached and now occupied the shores of northern France. He now stood at the threshold of final victory and looked across the channel to the barrier between him and the domination of Western Europe. The chalk cliffs of Dover rising sheer out of the waters that he would soon have to cross. But first came the onslaught by air. Squadrons of Heinkel 111s, Dorniers, Junkers 88s and Stuka dive bombers flew from their newly won bases in France to cover the now short distance that separated them from final victory. And reception committees were ready and waiting on the other side to greet them. Coastal spotters of the Observer Corps, WAFs tracking the positions of aircraft and shipping in British coastal waters. And Spitfires and Hurricanes of the RAF. It's still often believed that the earliest raids on Britain, indeed the Battle of Britain itself, was more or less confined to the southeast corner of England. But already at the beginning of July, directly after the fall of France, German bombers were active on Britain's north and eastern coasts. The girls in the ops rooms and RT sections worked endless hours plotting the positions of both German and British aircraft and often overhearing on the RT to the ops room controllers the cries of pilots plunging to untimely deaths in burning aircraft to the ground or seas below. Among prime targets of the JU-88s and Heinkels and the screaming Stuka dive bombers were the British merchant ships sailing between ports along the North Sea coast. By mid-August, the battle had begun to move increasingly to northern Britain as the coastline became more accessible from Norwegian bases which had now also fallen into German hands.
The German bombers pummeled the British convoys steaming northwards past Hull, Newcastle, the Farne Islands and Scottish coast. Soon it became the turn of the coast itself, its harbours and coastal installations to be singled out for attack. No area of the north was beyond the range of the German bombers, not even Scotland itself. The area of the Firth of Forth had in fact been attacked even before the fall of France, and German bombers had since become quite frequent visitors. All along the North Sea coasts, ports such as Hull, Middlesbrough, Newcastle, Sunderland were protected by cordons of barrage balloons. That's when I saw some raids going over Hull, and that's where I saw uh, shoot the balloon barrage down over the lockhead and some down the river. Just as the petrol refineries of northern France and the Low Countries had been major targets during the summer, now the refineries at British ports became the object of attack. The towns and cities of the north prepared themselves for the worst. One of the biggest fears at the start of the war was the possible use of poison gas. On the Saturday before war was declared on the Sunday, We'd been given our gas masks, little cardboard box, a piece of sting always on it. Proper proud walking around with that all day Saturday. Didn't take it off, went to bed with it. But that was the start of my war. A gas mask was issued to every single person in Britain with instructions how to use it. In Sheffield, the city took the process even a step further by carrying out an experimental gas attack in the streets of the town centre. It was probably one of the greatest reliefs of the war that gas was never ultimately used in the air raids throughout the whole of the war. Work in the factories intensified into round-the-clock shifts in the industrial heartland of the North, as reported by one of Northern England's leading wartime voices, J.B. Priestley. 
But not all of us live in such peaceful solitudes. Our great wealth has come from our industrial towns. Though these towns are anything but perfect dwelling places, though we've long been anxious to improve them and have been improving them, they are ours and all we ask is to be left alone to do what we like with our own. All the war industries are speeding up, speeding up. Millions are toiling day or night at a pace never equaled in our history. With its tradition of girls working in the wool and cotton mills of Lancashire and Yorkshire, women in industry were no novelty in the North. But after a year of war, the numbers had soared beyond two million, putting in long shifts on war work, then carrying out fire watch and civil defense duties, often under fire. They replaced the men who had gone into the forces. Women mechanics replaced men fitting aircraft engines. Women electricians putting in wiring. Women riveters working with men at the frames where the parts were assembled, riveting the aircraft wings. And every job to the completed aircraft. The contribution of the North was recognized early on in the war by a visit from the new Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. Wearing his Air Force uniform of Air Commodore of the RAF, Mr. Churchill makes an inspection at a bomber station during his round of visits in the Northeast, among other places where the Prime Minister makes his inspection while seated on the gun turret of a Covenanter. An inspiring sight comes with a massed formation of tanks and planes driving and flying past to the saluting base. The Prime Minister's party, which included Dr. Evert, the Australian Minister of External Affairs, later made a tour of a munitions factory where Mr. Churchill tries his hand at one of the machines. The operator is able to show him how she makes things hum at her section of the production line. Distance, you'll see Mr. Churchill exchanging a kiss for a cigar given to him by one of the women factory workers. The German bombers widened their range from attacks mainly on shipping and coastal objectives to targets inland, the factories and workshops turning out war materials. At first, each air raid warning severely hindered industrial output, for machines were turned off and everyone had to stop work and make their way to the factory basement shelter, even when there was no direct danger in the area. But soon, the work was interrupted only when the raiders were overhead. Gradually, the workforce ignored the sirens altogether and just carried on working until the bombers were actually dropping their loads in the immediate vicinity. During most of 1940, Few large-scale protracted raids had taken place in northern England until late December that year. In the two or three days that week, leading up to Christmas, people were preparing to enjoy themselves, even in conditions of much greater austerity than ever before. 
but not in Manchester from the night of Sunday, the 22nd of December. The city had been selected by the Germans for a major attack for the first time since the war began. The German crews were briefed that Manchester was a world center of textile industries and a vital adjunct through the ship canal to the important strategic port of Liverpool, as well as a major center of armaments production and war materials. I say within a mile and a half of Manchester Town Hall, there were 30 acres of buildings destroyed completely. Uh, it was just devastation. You know, the, the fire services, there was uh, 300 additional fire appliances brought in uh, with some 3,500 firemen. Uh, the water pressure had gone after the first night. They were using pumps uh, and auxiliary engines, uh, but a lot of the buildings were just left to burn. Uh, the first night, the uh, sirens started at, I think it was uh, 6.38, and within two minutes of the sirens going, the first wave of bombers came over and they started dropping the incendiaries. There were thousands of incendiary bombs dropped. The first bombers to arrive lit up the area for the following raiders. In amongst those, there was just one or two high explosives. Uh, and then after that, once the buildings had set alight, then the uh, bombers came over and dropped the very high explosives and the landmines, which came down on parachutes. Uh, they were the most deadly because they were a lot more TNT or explosives that just decimated and blew apart the buildings and, you know, just left rubble, nothing at all. Uh, there was one dropped on the uh, Hume Town Hall, which underneath there was a shelter, supposedly, uh, to hold 200. And on the night that that was bombed, there was 450 in it. Now, there was a rumour going round on the night that the, the whole of the people in the shelter had been killed, but that was untrue. I was at home because we were packing. Well, I packed to go away for Christmas, you know. And my friend, Annie, was, we were going together. The back of our house was opposite the docks. Uh, across a, a big waste ground was the docks, exactly where they were after. And the, uh, we used to watch for the lights going out. There were shielded lights, you know, the, the, the lights just shone down. And when them lights went out, we knew that the sirens were going to go any minute to, uh, you know, an air raid. So we just started getting our gear together, what we were taking to shelter, you know, blankets and drinks and what have you. And we go to the shelter, which was in the, um, the Colgate and Palmolive factory, right opposite where we lived. And we used to go in their shelter. My mum was deaf, totally deaf. And um, she never heard an, an air raid siren go or anything like that. I always had to go in and wake her up. But she wouldn't leave the house. Under no circumstances was Hitler going to get her out of that house. 270 planes dropped as many tons of high explosive and 37,000 incendiaries, causing some 400 fires. The city center and Trafford Industrial Park were the main target areas. When we came, came out of there the next morning, our home had gone and, you know, blown away. There was no way could we get back there so and then also there was an unexploded bomb so we all had to get out go go away from the area went to my uncle uh, uncle that lived lower down uh, further up the road and we um, we stayed there and that was the night that the it they call them um, they came down on a parachute a landmine and that that came down right in the middle of the street and it blew the front of the house we were in away. Come morning after the blitz and the all clear had gone, I got a message that there'd been a, <coughs> a load of bombs had also landed up at the top of the station, which is where my mate had lived and where the ARP warden shelter was. I chased up there 
and that had just disappeared. It had a direct hit, and he was in the air age longer. We buried him. <laughs> Sorry. We buried him four days later in a communal grave in Southern Cemetery. What they found. Um, and I think that is when the war really hit on. I think I can honestly turn on and say, that was it. I knew then what war was all about. We got some, in, especially in Trafford Park, and uh, I, I think there was, you know, one or two uh, areas in the dock area that caught fire. You know that uh, I, I'm not sure, but I think there was one or two ships that were in dock that uh, that went went up. You know, something similar to like it was in Liverpool because they lost a lot of ships. It fell to the city fire brigade, aided by the auxiliary fire service, to try to prevent the city centre becoming entirely swallowed up in flames. At the peak of the raid that night, over 3,000 extra firefighters were drafted in, along with 400 extra appliances, to combat the spread of flames throughout the city centre. Despite their enormous efforts, which continued without a break into the following hours of daylight after the raid, almost 10 acres of central Manchester were gutted or destroyed, and over 30 acres within a mile or so of the town hall. When the people of the city came to work or to carry out their daily domestic concerns next morning, they found scores of buildings long familiar to them now destroyed and streets blocked everywhere by tons of rubble. Some of the rubble which only yesterday had been their place of work or their local shops. Hundreds of houses had been severely damaged whole streets totally destroyed. Large public buildings, churches, hospitals, shopping streets and places of entertainment were badly damaged or now heaps of heavy, massive rubble to be searched through and moved, much of it by sheer manpower, for there simply weren't enough spare machines or any form of mechanical power available to help them. Some of Manchester's most illustrious public buildings were now lost to the city. Buildings such as the Victorian Free Trade Hall, not only a place for public meetings, but once home to the world-famous Halle Symphony Orchestra. And there was serious damage to the cathedral and other Manchester landmarks, including Piccadilly, the Marketplace, the Royal Exchange. Before the city had a chance to recover from that raid, the Germans struck again the following night. The second night wasn't as intensive because there was only about 55 bombs dropped on that day, high explosives, as, long as, the, as well as the incendiaries. Uh, and the, the uh, alarm didn't go off until 7.15 in the evening. But uh, that was the one that hit the Piccadilly which was absolutely decimated from Portland Street to uh, Mosley Street. There was a four buildings, five-storey buildings, completely gutted. And the fire was so intense, it was moving back towards the back part of the city. Uh, bombs from the first night had destroyed some of the buildings, and the Royal Engineers in the afternoon blew up some of the other buildings to make a natural fire break. Once again, Damage to buildings was caused mainly by the fires from over 7,000 incendiary bombs dropped that night on the city. Now we watched, watched the searchlights crisscrossing. We watched the bombers going over. You could see them at times. You could actually see them as well as hearing the drone. You could actually see them. And occasionally the searchlights would pick up a landmine coming down, floating down with a parachute on it. You'd see them. Don't they? And then it went very quiet, we thought, well, my mum said, come on, let's go to bed, it's, it's finished now. So that's where we went. And next thing I know, there's a, 
I'm covered in dust and I'm hanging outside. I, I, at that moment of time, I lived in the terrace house. We lived in the terrace house and the gable end had gone completely. My head was towards the wall and the bed went out with the gable end. The roof came down and caught the foot of the bed, which was a metal bed in them days, and hung on to it so that it didn't actually fall straight out. And I was laid there until they actually came and got me out of it. So exciting, full of sorts and muck and brick and you name it, that was me. My friend that I went to school with, um, it brings tears to my eyes when I think about it, but my friend I went to school with, whenever I was late, she was late, and we both got the cane. You know, if she was late, I was late, we'd get the cane. But we always went together. And I found out afterwards that she'd been killed instantly. Attacks were also carried out on other northwest cities, such as the daylight raid on Warrington during a town gala on the 14th of September in 1940. I was uh, office boy for the Thamesport Mills. I'd started there on the 1st of July, 1940. And, um, this occurrence, this Saturday afternoon on the 14th of September, was a, what we call a sports day in aid of a Spitfire fund. And we were trying to raise money to buy Spitfire for the war effort, of course. And uh, everything was going along fine, lovely afternoon. Lots of people enjoying themselves. and. Uh, I was in this little pavilion, which we used to use for the cricket pavilion, and um, I was talking to some friends in there, and I suddenly had a laugh and a joke with somebody, and they said, well, I'm off now, I'm going. And I stepped outside uh, through the door onto you know, the, the cricket field, and I heard a plane, glanced up, and uh, I saw the shape of a a plane, I could see the crosses on the wings, and I suddenly noticed two objects leave the aircraft. And they started to spiral. And I realised then what they were, and I shouted bombs, and hurried, ran, and flung myself down. Nobody anticipated anything like this, suddenly, out of the blue. Uh, an aircraft appeared from nowhere. I mean, nobody, as far as I know now to this day, I don't think there's ever been any recorded uh, incident anywhere where that plane was ever shot down. This new memorial stone, which was erected in 91, is within, to the best of our knowledge, 10 yards of where the bomb actually fell. And this stone was erected and paid for entirely by the Burst Development Company. Completing their inspection of cities which have so far borne the brunt of Nazi attack, the King and Queen went to Stoke-on-Trent. Here they not only had a great reception, but they were able to see how factories were carrying on in spite of the blip. Later they were greeted by the Mayor of Salford and proceeded to another badly bombed area, meeting and talking with many of the workers. And the gallant ARP services were on parade. Their Majesties saw the damage done to the Royal Exchange at Manchester, and they certainly saw that the fighting spirit of the North is stronger than ever. The one commodity that was never in short supply in the North was entertainment, and the spirits of the people were constantly kept high by a broad range of Northern comedians and entertainers, such as Tommy Handley, Frank Randall, Gracie Fields, and George Formby who also used their appearances for raising funds to help victims of enemy activity. Pathé Gazette is glad to help George Formby, the famous comedian, in a great effort for relief of distress in blitzed areas. Well, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it's... Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say to you because... You see, I'm trying to raise 40,000 pounds. I feel this, that in the good days, we artists earned all our money in these cities. And in the good days after the war, we'll still earn our money. 
So I think it's the least we can do is to come and help these towns in their bad days. And I think that the, uh, that the people who haven't been blitzed should help the people who have been blitzed. And if anybody cares to send a contribution, they can send it to George Formby, care of the BBC. Now, please do your best and help. Thank you. In total, I think there's 360 raids altogether uh, on Manchester itself. Well, the worst one was, was the Blitz. Two nights before, it was Liverpool, of course, and then we got ours. But we knew what was coming because there was a, a Lord Haw Haw. Uh, he was a, a Germany calling. And little did we know, he had a very uh, pronounced accent, a very high-class accent. Uh, Germany calling, Germany calling, this is Lord Haw Haw. The raid tonight will be on the city of Manchester. The voice you hear is that of Lord Haw Haw. The Blitzkrieg will be carried over the British Islands with greater, more appalling rapidity than over Poland, Norway, Holland, Belgium or France. So you knew what was coming, and we didn't know at the time, but he lived in a little village just outside of Oldham called Shaw. Now, all his elocution lessons didn't do him any good because uh, he was tried for treason as a traitor and hung by the neck after the war. But uh, we heard his voice, but we didn't realise he lived so near, five, six miles away. During his visit to Manchester, Australia's Prime Minister can't resist going to Old Trafford to see how the test cricket pitch looks. He has his cine camera with him to photograph the patch on the wicket caused by a bomb. The state of the pavilion leaves Mr Menzies wondering if it was Hitler or Larwood who did it. After autographing an incendiary bomb, the groundsman solemnly presents it as a gift to the Melbourne CC from the Lancashire Club. It's a different kind of test this year. England and Australia team together, and they're both going to win. Visits like these to bombed cities by leading world politicians were always welcome, and especially from America not yet in the war, for the sympathy and support they could provide for Britain from the American public. Mr. Wendell Wilkie had a pretty hectic time before concluding his tour of Britain. He saw Liverpool and a lot of the damage there, and a lot of the people there. He was entertained by Lord Derby, and he went to Manchester. Everywhere, Mr. Wilkie was given a great reception, and everywhere he had to sign autographs. Then, after a flying visit to Era, he was honoured by the King and Queen, who invited him to tea. So an amazing visit ended with Mr Wilkie talking with His Majesty, who, like so many of his subjects, made him thoroughly welcome. On the 12th of December, 1940, the Luftwaffe took off from its airfield to make its first major raid on the city of Sheffield. As a centre of Britain's steelmaking, one of the most indispensable of war materials, it was certainly remarkable that the city had escaped the attentions of the Luftwaffe until then and had scarcely been touched during the first three months of the Blitz. The raid was followed up soon afterwards by a further heavy attack on the night of the 15th, 16th of December. The tram was a prominent feature of Sheffield's city transport scene, and one of the most notable results of the raid was the damage done to the city's trams by the incendiary bombing. It resulted not only in the destruction and overturning of more than 30 trams, but also in some of them becoming welded to the tracks by their molten metal, resulting from the heat of the fire bombs and so preventing fire appliances from reaching many of the main fires in the city. For many Sheffield citizens, that fortnight leading up to Christmas was anything but festive as they contemplated the damage to their homes, if indeed they still had a home at all following those mid-December raids. The 
king and queen visit Sheffield to fulfill a promise made after the last bombing of the city. Amid the ruins of humble homes, their majesties are welcomed as if the occasion were a holiday. Every few yards, the queen stops to talk to groups of people made homeless by the savagery of the Hun. A friendly word to the women and children evokes the same reply. We can take it. But there's going to be a day of reckoning. One of the Luftwaffe's earliest victims was the city of Kingston-upon-Hull, to use its full and proper name. Its position on the east coast side of England made it more easily accessible from German bases on the continent, with no anti-aircraft barrages for their aircraft to face over the North Sea before they reached the port of Hull. The city suffered very heavy raids during March 1941, but even worse on the night of May the 7th. In the space of only two hours, 3,000 houses were burnt to the ground or severely damaged, making 10% of the population instantly homeless. Next night, the 8th and 9th was even worse, and the result of a last-minute German change of plan. The target, originally intended to be Sheffield, was changed in mid-flight due to a sudden worsening en route of light and weather conditions ahead, and the bomber force was diverted to Hull instead, resulting in one of the city's most devastating raids. Over the two nights, 800 fires engulfed the city. The number of homeless leapt to 30,000. In fact, no less than one-third of Hull's citizens left the city altogether during the following days. Whole streets were wiped out, along with many of the city's most prominent buildings. All of a sudden, I was looking up and I saw this huge fireball in the sky, which was rather unusual, uh, anti-aircraft shells exploded in the sky that made a very, you know, you could see them, you knew what they were. But this was a sort of a fireball that was followed by an enormous explosion. And I don't think none of, I, I spoke to family and friends about it, but nobody else seemed to have witnessed it apart from me. But uh, I just assumed it must have been a, a German aircraft was hit by anti-aircraft and it probably still had his bombs on board. This particular night when the bombs were going, I got under the table, I was so, table like that, underneath there, so scared, as though that would save me, you know. And, um, oh, there was soot everywhere, but we weren't hit, so we just got up, cleaned it up, and went on. You, you know, with our business. Amazing, really. Yet despite these raids, the city was never mentioned by name in the press but for some unfathomable reason, always referred to simply as a northeast town. The people of Hull generally were very aggrieved. <laughs> it seems rather strange, but whenever, on the radio during the war, obviously they were restricted with what could give out, what news bulletins. But we used to hear the news that Coventry, Plymouth and all these other cities across the country, Sheffield had all got blitzed. And they used to mention them by name. And whenever Hull got a heavy raid, it was always a northeast coast town, which was rather strange. And there's been a, a lot of uh, theories put forward as to why this was the case. But I don't think there's been any definite answer to that question, why was Hull referred to as a northeast coast town? By the time the raids on Hull came to an end, Destruction in the city was among the country's highest for its size. Its streets and landmark buildings were flattened or finished up as shells. The Guildhall and the City Hall, Jameson and Prospect Streets, the Prudential Assurance Tower. More than 1,000 citizens killed, over 80,000 houses damaged. So much for the city never named, but known simply as the northeast coast town raided last night. 
but Hull's contribution to the war was at least recognized by the war cabinet and by special visits from the king and queen. The city was also visited by Winston Churchill as part of a tour of the northeast. The Premier has completed a high-speed tour of the northeast of England, and whether he was inspecting troops, munition works, or the results of a blitz, he got a great welcome everywhere. He rode around in an armoured scout car while inspecting an armoured brigade, and he went on to Newcastle on Tyne to see how the shipyard workers were doing there. He saw that the workers and all the people there are in great heart, and that this vital aspect of our war effort is more than good. Both here and at Hull, which has suffered a number of heavy blitzes, everyone is confident and quite undeterred by anything the enemy has done or may attempt to do. On the contrary, Northerners have every intention of hitting back. There was plenty of evidence of this at Sheffield, where Mr. Churchill looked over an arms factory. He complimented the workers here on the way they're getting on with the job, and he also made a surprise speech at the town hall. No matter how long this foul war might last, he said, the British Commonwealth of Nations will come through united, undaunted, stainless, unflinching. Great crowds collected in the streets of the city to see the man whose leadership is such an inspiration. On visits like this, he himself must surely draw inspiration from the people. By the middle of 1941, the concentrated night blitz by the Luftwaffe had virtually come to an end. True, daytime raids continued to inflict damage on towns, cities and villages all over Britain, but the raids were never frequent in any given place nor on anything like the scale of the 1940-41 campaign. In common with the rest of Britain, the North could begin the Herculean task of clearing its shattered streets and buildings and to start making good the damage. The war news, too, improved greatly month by month, especially with the Allied D-Day landings onto the beaches of Normandy in June 1944. But within a mere few days of the landings, disaster and damage suddenly struck the towns and cities and indeed the open countryside of Britain once again. And completely, unexpectedly, by weapons which had no difficulty reaching the north of the country as easily as the southernmost areas nearest to occupied Europe. And I remember the Doodle Books on um, Trinity Street, which is a few minutes' walk from where we lived, uh, also had the Doodle Books and all the houses that shook, you know. But we sort of took it in our stride, actually. And on a Friday night, we still got ready and went out dancing and <laughs> just ignored it, you know, it was amazing. Yeah. The flying bombs, which fell on Britain in the 10 months between June 1944 and March 1945, caused great damage to the areas which they so haphazardly struck. 
But for a while, the damage which they did to public morale was also serious, possibly more so than the night blitz had done four years previously. If that was so, perhaps it was because when the war seemed to be as good as over, suddenly the end seemed to recede as far away as ever. In spite of that, the determination to see it through did not diminish. It was a mood aptly expressed in the summing up of an American commentator. The grim and gay defiance of the old Blitz days was gone. People were tired, but their strength was great. For they knew that the long battle was being won and that their sacrifices were speeding the victory. I didn't hear any more moaning or groaning. It was, let's get on with it. You know, everybody was working 12-hour days. And then when they came home, they had to go and do firefighting duties. Or, you know, incendiary watches and, and them sort of things. You know, so most people didn't have time to worry about them sort of things. They were doing an 18, 20-hour day. I think the idea uh, of the Blitzkrieg was, uh, first of all, fear and trepidation and trying to cause panic. Well, that failed miserably because uh, the indomitable spirit of the people of Manchester and Salford, Setford, all the surrounding areas, they were there, not, we're not going to let the Germans beat us. And that was the feeling that was abroad. There was no doubt about it. We overcome what they were trying to do to us to cause chaos among the civilian population. It didn't work. 